Welcome once again to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Now let's go to Off the Press um, and have a quick review of the major stories making headlines across Nigeria today. I'll start with the Punch newspapers and uh, of course we'll be introducing our guests right after this. Uh, the big one uh, on your screen should be on your screen in a few seconds. Yes, it says uh, Jaga Utomi groups, others uh, team up against APC, PDP and unveil party on October 1st. PRP, ADC, LP to form nucleus of new mega party plan convention. Also, 95 associations seek registration as political parties and uh, more to emerge. On as a demand canoes release, IPOP threatens 30 days shutdown. 2023, Southern Presidency Sacrosanct of Enifere backs governors. Ogun Pensioners, Ground Secretariat, Lockout SSG, protesting 68 billion naira gratuity arrears. And also, pregnant woman and two others kidnapped in Ogun Forest during prayer. Abductors demand 30 million naira. Ooh. Also on the punch, Aerofire masquerading as leader, exporting banditry to south, says Akiri Dulu. And uh, we can also find on the punch, daily fuel consumption jumps to 72 million liters. Subsidy hits 541.66 billion naira. PDP zones national chairman slot to southwest. North gets secretary. And also Amcon seizes ex-governor Ahmed's houses, freezes accounts over 5 billion naira debt. Finally, Nigeria and 39 others may not attain pre-COVID-19 GDP levels by 2026. Those are the big stories on the uh, punch. Oh, also, of course, um, cooking gas, marketers lack facilities, say LNNG. And of course, uh, the price hits 7,000 naira. On the leadership newspaper, on the sideline of the UN General Assembly, FG pushes for recovery of 2 billion uh, pounds looted funds says $700 million recovery made in four years and 200 million pounds stock in the U.S. You insist on prosecution of surrendered terrorists with 285 case files in court. Ganduje mourns as Gaia Emir dies at 91. APC postpones states' congresses. Suspends in PDP as zoning committee sits today. FCDA spends 412 million naira monthly to evacuate waste. Flood ravages Abuja. Senate OK's 13.98 trillion naira 2022 budget projection. Approves $57 per barrel oil benchmark. 410 naira to a dollar exchange rate passes 2022 to 2024 medium term expenditure framework and fiscal strategy paper anti-open grades and law your attack on us devious southern governors tell erufai i think those are the ones that they can look at on the leadership newspaper today daily independent coming next it says here pdp leadership crisis secundus vows to fight on refuses to withdraw court case. Also, Senate OK's 13.98 trillion naira for 2022 budget, approves $57 per barrel oil benchmark, and uh, 410 naira to the dollar exchange rate. Senator blames Obasan Joy Yarado and Jonathan for Nigeria's debt burden. Mm. And 10 new national parks to boost biodiversity to commence, uh, commence soon. Also on the Daily Independent, um, uh, prosecution of Boko Haram sponsors to commence soon, says Malami, and reps decry state of federal roads, say they are death traps. Gunmen attack checkpoint, kill two police officers in Enugu. FEC OK is a 1.04 billion naira cost of uh, variation for health, water resources, ministries. And also, IPOB vows to lock down Southeast for one month if Kanu is not arraigned. Finally, on the Daily Independent, Apcon, Amcon seizes former Kwara governor's mansion over 5 billion naira debt. Okay, let's take a final look at this newspaper here, The Nation. And uh, it says, Zoning, PDP North leaders take formula before panel. We'll stick to 2017 distribution of offices. Oguani panel meets with party chiefs in Enugu. Nigeria pushing to recover £2 billion uh, pounds loot, 285 terror cases ongoing. 2.3 billion naira cocaine seized at airport in Abuja. NDLA arrest suspects. Makinde nominates five as commissioners. 
5 billion naira debt. Amcon takes over ex-governor's mansion. APC shifts states' congresses. Shagu Oni picks PDP governorship forms. Vat Rao threatens federal government's 8.36 trillion naira 2022 revenue target. Malami says there will seek Supreme Court decision. Subsidy scam. How firm defrauded government of 1.4 billion naira, Bawa tells court. I think those are the stories we're taking a look at this morning. Um, good morning to our guest, public affairs analyst, Mr. Ezekiel Nyaitok. Good morning. Always a pleasure to be on Plus TV Africa. Fantastic. Lots of stories here on the papers. Where would you like to start? Well, um, definitely, definitely, it has to do with the mega party arrangement. And um, we could spend the whole time on it, not just the story, but the, the, the motive behind the story. I was listening to uh, your analysis on doctors and you know the trending stories and everything and how people are living in this country. And um, there are many of us that can afford, we really, by the grace of God, can afford to live anywhere in the world. But when you sit back and think of it and know that for people like myself, we're where we are because this country provided a platform when we're younger. Now, when we leave, what we're saying is that the younger ones, you take care of yourself because over 99.9% .9 of Nigerians cannot afford the luxury of traveling out uh, because of our poverty rate and everything. So I think it behoves all women and men of conscience to think again that you can afford does not mean that it's the best thing for you to set out or to jet out. I, I can understand, I can feel the frustration. I run a company, I've never held any public office. I've been a private sector person all my life. I had to pay my fees in school and the company I registered in school uh, over about 40 years ago is a company that I'm still working with till today. And I find it really frustrating, the way that you cannot get funds to do anything, the way that insecurity has just come. You can't do any analysis that makes sense for you to project your company. And as a result, it seems a shorter route for you to just shut down everything you have, bought the next flight. And in my own case, my three children are graduated, so it's just my wife and I, so it's so much easier to jet out. But the question is, is that the most conscientious thing to do at this stage of my life? And the answer says no. Okay, Mr. Sing I, talk. Um, I yeah. wanted us to um, now take the stories one after the other. First of all, yeah. Amcon has seized the property, the mansion of a uh, former Kwara state governor over a five billion era debt. And it's on the Daily Independent. The story is also on the Punch newspaper. It says Amcon seizes gov Governor Amit's houses, freezes accounts over five billion era debt. Now he responded to this, say the seizure of his house is unnecessary. So looking at this and the fact that Amcon has been on a debt recovery drive for a while now, trying to get this, you know, properties and for people who have, who have owed the government. So what do you think? Do you think that um, you know, this is a step in the right direction, the seizure of these properties because they have failed to pay their debt? And why exactly these debts in the first place? You owe, you pay. I mean, there's nothing to analyze in that. When you go to the bank to borrow money, you borrow knowing that there are consequences. The only thing is that if, for instance, you borrowed against a project, maybe government projects, like I was discussing with a friend last night. And it so happens that that government is not paying, you've done your part of the bargain. What you do is write that, um, the bank immediately and tell them that on account of this or that, I'm not able to get my payment out and I would please wish that you stop the interest. This particular guy last night um, that we're discussing borrowed about 60 million from the bank and uh, he did a government job, he completed, and before he was paid, the money in the bank had gone to over 400 million. And um, luckily, he got a good advice from a legal practitioner. And um, somewhere along the line, he had written the bank and showed evidence that he had done the work, but government was owing him. So when they eventually went to court, the court was able to ask that the interest be terminated at the time that he wrote the letter so long as he had provided the evidence that he was being owed, that 
when you lend money to um, a company, it's like a transaction. You make profit and you make losses. You know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So well, if, if the governor, for instance, believes that, number one, that he, he had that, um, that um, asset legitimately, because that's another story as a governor, how much you have, how, how come you have such a, a worth? What were you before you became a governor? And that's another story, probably for ICPC and maybe not EFCC, I don't know. And then if that be the case, then what he has to do is to know that banks lend from public funds, from people's deposits. And as a result, he owes them that duty of care. I've, I've got into that problem once or twice. So you, you need to know you've got to pay, but you need to be able to bargain your case. So you can't tell Amcom they can't come. Rather, you can show them costs that either you are making efforts to repay or your sources of revenue on account of which the money was, you know, advanced in the first place was um, is not from your side. Right. So whichever way you borrow, you pay. That's that's the that's the, right. the way. Sorry, I talk. A good thing, you know, we're going to move from the story to the next one. Um, and a good, one of the you know links between these two stories is that the person we're speaking about whose property is being seized is one of those who has started this new political movement with uh, Professor Pat Tomi and um, um, a few uh, Atahiru Jaga, for my chairman, and a few others. Uh, so let's now talk about the idea of a, a third force, you know, and this new party that has been uh, you know um, birthed here. Um, it seems to happen every four years. Where do you see this going? Well, the first thing is that I want to tell Nigerians that it started over two years ago. I say that because I can say authoritatively. I'm the head of organization in the National Consultative Front. I'm also in the major committee and also in the steering committee. For the past two years, we've traversed the nooks and crannies of this country because we say we can no longer just wait and be taken by surprise. So what is coming up now is not an ad hoc stuff. And um, uh, what happened the, um, two days back, which is in the news um, all over, is um, not exactly rightly reported, but let me not dispel that. Yes, there is a coalition of different interests, different levels. I belong to probably about two or three different people doing things, and eventually we are going to come together dovetail into a vehicle of women and men of conscience where we are going to say, look, let's form a national emergency rescue team. This is, there are a lot of good people in APC. There are a lot of good people in PDP. So painting everybody with the same brush is not okay. But the principles, the operational dynamics and principles of APC and PDP is strictly entrepreneurial. It's an enterprise. It is not, it's not about governance. And we cannot continue. That's why we've become the poverty capital of the world. To them, politics is about means to, you know, it is an investment of sort. And they look at it from that perspective and not about providing service. If you look at the chapter 2, section 14, subsection 2B of the national constitution, Nigerian constitution, it says that the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. That's not their guiding principles. It's about your loyalty and retaining your position and making milking the system is your primary purpose for getting into government. And you can blame them. That's why they sell their house, they sell their conscience to buy us out. And we are waking up to tell Nigerians you can have an alternative. Even on the 1st of um, uh, October that they are talking about announcing a mega party, it's not going to be announcing a mega party. I can say that authoritatively. On the 1st of October, there's going to be the second, second national rescue summit. That means we've had one before. You know, this is going to be the second national rescue summit. And in that summit, Across board, across Nigeria, leaders of conscience, men and women, the youth, everybody is coming, going to come out and give their expression of the next you know, steps. And I think that is something that Nigerians should look out for. A okay. lot is going on. Um, it, it, it could seem like two years is a short time in politics. But I can tell you that in politics, when the foundations have been right, 
a month can make the strategic difference. All right, Mr. And I'm Yaito. telling you authoritatively that Nigerians are already positioned to make that change. We can't run away. Okay, so still on that political conversation, um, when we take a look at the Nation newspaper, the headline there on that nation says, Zoning, PDP North leaders take formula before panel. Now, they had an agreement on Tuesday night, and what they've come up with is to agree that they are going to zone, um, you know, this political arrangement to the south and also when we take a look at this um, next paper it's the punch it also says that 2023 southern presidency sacrosant offended for a backs gov governors so the pdp leadership um, seems to want to take the side and lean towards the South. Afenifere is also back in the presidency um, for the South. But there's also that Northern Coalition, the opposition, that says that, you know, the next president of Nigeria should also come from the northern part of the country. Um, so where do you weigh in regarding the zoning conflict? We, we, my, my position is relatively, and I talk as an individual, not as a representing an institution. I've come to realize that the leadership recruitment process should go beyond North and South. If you carry an incompetent pilot and put in the cockpit, that aircraft is guaranteed to crash. I know that there are competent people in every state of the Federation, not just geopolitical zone, not just North South. There are competent people. But our leadership recruitment process has not been able to throw up the best. And I want to tell you as an individual that PDP, APC, any of these people, if they give me half current from the South, and then one small party or a third force gives me an extremely competent person from the North, I want this country to be properly driven or to be properly piloted or you know, governed. To that extent, I think we should pay more emphasis on the quality of person and not from the where the person comes from. Because at the end of the day, Nigeria is run by the person called Mr. Buhari. Whether it's from the North or from the South, those are not the, the idiosyncrasies. It's about who he is as a person. And then the conversations you start to feel, you know, center around the qualities, the three Cs, character, competence, capability. Those are the things we should start driving and tell my Igbo Oriental brethren, you have these stars, parade them, bring them out. As you are pleading for people to, uh, I don't want to use the word pleading, as you are making a case for your section of the country, make that case based on the fact that you can profile one, two, three people. Let it be what works pari pasu, and not just the sentiment of my people, my people, my people. You know, even from my state, people are starting to say, please, 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 we want to know who is the best person right now, whether you come from the south, you come from the north, is inconsequential. And I think that the north has competent people, the south has competent people. Let these people start to parade their stars so that Nigerians, at the end of the day, it's not PDP that is going to vote. They can do their zoning and zone to wherever they want. If another party brings up an extremely competent person, which is what we are doing right now, you know, in what you may call the third force, we, we are zoning it to competence. We are zoning it to capacity. We are zoning it to capability. And above all, we are bringing Nigerians. There's this, you know, presidential, uh, what they call the Nigeria CEO project. That's what we want to do. And we are opening up the space for Nigerians all across board to give us nominations on who they think will be the most suitable person. And after that, we are going to go into a voting process extremely transparent so that there's going to be a conversation shifting from APC, PDP to competence, to character, to capacity, to capability. And then when we continue to do those votings and eliminating, conversations will start to zero in on the qualities of the persons their characters, their, you know, what they've been able to achieve in the past. And when we come down to about 18 and move them into what we call the Nigeria Project House, we're going to have a leadership recruitment process that the whole world is going to say, go and look at what is going in Nigeria. And the conversation will shift from PDP-APC 
to who is the most competent. And by the time that we're able to bring up that person, let PDP bring up any person, let APC bring up any person, they are going to provide, propose them before Nigerians. Nigerians will take the decision. And I can tell you this for free, that decision is going to go by way of who is going to be the best person to take us out of this very infamous tag of being the poverty capital of the world. Well, sorry, talk, and I'm happy um, that Plus TV Africa yeah. is one of our great major partners in this drive. And I want to thank you people for it. All right, Messiah talk, you know, still on this, you know, conversation. Um, yes, you know, it might sound really, really interesting and, you know, like the right way to go. Um, competence instead of uh, tribe or religion or, or, or region. Um, but, you know, I think it's also important, uh, you know, that we, you know, look at the facts that, you know, the timing might be a little short. I know you've already mentioned that, you know, two years, you know, or one month, you know, as long as you get it right, you know, people would always move in that direction, which is, you know, from your perspective. Um, but the political structures that these other two major political parties have, have run for, you know, more than 20 years now. Um, how do you think that Nigerians, aside those who you can reach out to online and the ones who you can ask these questions and streamline, you know, the candidates, you know, until you get to that one person, um, how do you think that, you know, this can be sold to 200 million people in the time that we have? I'm, I'm sure you are also aware that there's still a challenge with getting as many people registered or even in, interested in the voting process. Um, there's many of these concerns. How do you think all of this can work? If INEC is not able to register that many people, if we're not able to, or if Nigeria is not able to get many, many, many more young people um, registered to vote between now and 2023, um, how do you think that it's possible that whoever it is that your, your candidate is will, you know, become relevant in, in enough time before 2023? Absolutely valid question. Absolutely so. Like I said, for the past, um, in the immediate past six months, we've had all manner of think tanks. Right now, I'm in Abuja. I came in yesterday strictly for one meeting, and as soon as I finish with you, I'm on my way back to the airport, I go back to base in Uyo. Why am I saying that? Look at present realities. Look at Big Brother. What structures does it have? It gets... <laughs> 60 million, 20 million votes, people to vote. What you need to do is drive a process that appeals to the young people. We've sat down and we thought about it. And that process commences October 1. That's what I'm saying, that what you've been hearing, like mega party put forward, is really not going to be a mega party stuff. It's a process that's going to start, that we've been working all the 18 parties minus two. We've talked to all of them i'm a member of that committee so that party formation is there there's already that coalition there's already that understanding we're just crossing the t's and dotting the i's so we're not in a hurry to shout out so that is already there then secondly you will be the major driver of what you're doing the reason is that when you can see the light at the end of the tunnel all the media houses within one month can cause a level of awareness and enlightenment that is unprecedented in this country. When the man in the village gets to see that for once, we're having, let me even just make it a little shorter. Are you aware that we had less than 35% of registered voters voting? The reason is usually two. One is that they are choosing between the rock and the hard place. Second is that they are not even sure that their vote will count. So how do we address these two? Number one, in terms of vote, we are having the, this second, this second um, uh, national summit is a consensus building around one topic, electronic transmission of results. We want INEC to know that Nigeria is completely behind them. And the quality of people that are going to be speaking, you will be impressed yourself. So we are going to have quality electoral process. And the chairman of INEC has already said, before he made such a statement openly, he's thought through it. He said, without biometric identification, there will be no voting. It's such a powerful statement that he made. And before he made that statement, there's a reason why the Senate refused to call him to come and testify on the floor because he's made up his mind. And I want to show that he's not alone. 
Nigerians are behind him. So number one, there's going to be proper voting where your vote will count. And secondly, we're going to bring through the people, bring out quality candidates that Nigeria will be excited about. So within these two parameters about all things, <laughs> and within the voting process, we are raising the money. It's going to be warehoused by one of the biggest audit firms in this country because of integrity. It's going to use blockchain technology. We've been on it to build confidence in Nigerians. You can't give what you don't have. All those kalo kalo things, people are appearing overnight. No, Nigerians will see the processes evolving, and with each step, there will be confidence building. At the end of the day, we would have started a process of really rescuing Nigeria, and I'm very excited to be part of this. Okay, so I want us to now begin to talk money. There are lots of money topics on the papers this morning. Um, one of them that we've seen, I think this is even a headline on one of the papers, and it's on the leadership newspaper. The leadership says, FG pushes for recovery of two billion pounds looted funds. And it says that um, this is a statement by Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami. He says that in four years, um, the federal government has recovered $700 million. And it says £200 million pounds is stock in the U.S. And um, taking a closer look at this story, Malami is basically saying that um, there's like lots of looted funds, Nigerian politicians, Nigerian businessmen who have siphoned money meant for the general public and, you know, taking that, stashing it in several, so many other countries. And they're in talks with um, countries like the UK to make sure that these stolen funds are repatriated um, to the tune of $2 billion. And when we convert that to Naira, it's about 1.12 trillion Naira that has been taken out of the country. And Ms. Anye, talk, we keep talking about blocking leakages and um, that even when we're able to block these leakages, the funds that have been stolen out of the country and are repatriated, what exactly are we using them for? This continues to be a subject of debate, Mr. Anye, talk. So can we go back to the first conversation about how to prevent um, politicians and businessmen from taking money meant for Nigerians out of the country for their own personal benefit? You know, it's like um, we carry a lovely piece of yarn and we leave it with the goat to take care of it. And then we come back and we are so shocked that the goat has eaten the yarn. I ask, where is the problem with the goat or with the person who gave yam, goat yam to keep? You and I know how these people sell their, their soul to get into office. Why do they get into office? It's a very simple, straightforward question. They get into office to, to milk the system. Let me just put it raw. Almost everybody, 99, 98, 95% of the people, service has absolutely nothing to do. That's why they say politics is a do or die. When did you, when last did you find people fighting on the street to wash your clothes for you, to work for you, to serve you? No, they don't. So when you see somebody fighting on the street to s serve you, it's just commonsensical they're now doing that. So it's to that extent that we keep hearing, let me hear, we hear of looted funds repatriated, we hear of borrowing, and then what do we not see? What these funds, where they are applied. We do not see them in the infrastructure at the level, at a commensurate level. We do not see it on our uh, human capital development to a commensurate level. Let me tell you very easily. Any person that's a leader that thinks should know that IT is the world of the future, talking about the fourth revolution. Our children are so gifted that in the crypto coin currency that you say, we are like the second highest in the world. Our children are so gifted that in 419 and advanced fee fraud, we have a way. Now, can a leader not realize that this is a gift that is misplaced? And on account of that, instead of setting up a system to catch the thief, you set up a robust system to tweak this thing to use it properly tweak this skill that we have. 
Make sure that every young person has a laptop. Every tertiary institution student has a laptop. Programming is put in the laptop. Then you build an ecosystem that can isolate the scammers. These people, as much as I do not want to justify what they are doing, you must agree with me that our young people must survive. So let's have a governance system that thinks of them that harvest their potentials in the right direction. Instead of calling them lazy youth and tagging them with all sorts of things, and now they become rebellious. It's like, you go to hell. And it's not good enough for us because the leaders are stealing the money. The youth, you tell them to behave, and how are they going to become something when there is nothing that leads them, that guides them, that directs them in the right direction. How many role models do we have? How many of the people, I tell my governor, when you go for a meeting, the people that sit at the high table are the commissioners, the chairman, the this, the that. I don't see the best graduating students sitting on the high table. I don't see the entrepreneur that is doing very well sitting on the high table. I don't see that teacher that is the best teacher sitting on the high table to form an inspiration to the younger ones to know that excellence pays. What they see is that politics pays. And politics within this context is not that of service, but that of a young person who was a street tout and now he's an essay, a PA, and you go look at the house he's living. We're just confusing our young people, and we can't continue this way. We can't. Um, um, talking money now, uh, theft, and let's move to the southeast, where another crisis is very likely brewing. Um, it says on the punch this morning, Ohaneza demands Kanu's release, and also IPOB threatens 30-day shutdown um, if he is not, of course, arraigned. Um, so let, let's quickly get your thoughts on on all of this. Uh, there I want to play. Yes, yep. I want to play the devil's advocate. Go ahead, please. I'm in Northerner. I'm in power. Southerners threatening to shut down their, their 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 section of the country for 30 days, and I'm like, go ahead, boy. Our schools are shut in the north, man. Our factories are shut in the north. You guys are making money. You guys are making business. So please. Guys, make sure that Kanu does not come out. Make sure that they shut down so that the students will not be able to go and write their work, so that the companies will not be able to operate, so that the economy of the Southeast will start to suffer what we are suffering in the North. Mm -hmm. That's playing the devil's advocate of a terrible Nigerian. And it's a case of smiting your nose to spite your face. Please, come on. These guys should be a little more strategic than that. Unless, of course, they are playing the fifth columnist to make sure that Kanu is never released. Are they expecting that the federal government is going to be so worried, so scared, they are going to be so bothered? We're not talking of shutting down Abuja that will affect them. You're talking of shutting down Southeast. How does that affect the price of Gary in their own side of the divide? I think we need to be a little more strategic in the things that we do. We need to, and the one problem I have with Kanu is that he just does not have strategic thinkers with him. And the next thing is that once they do that, the average Igbo man who lives on trade on a daily basis, he's going to say to hell to be with this kind of, what is it? What does he want with Nigeria? Who says I want to leave Nigeria? He's going to have a subtle revolt because people are starting to say, and he doesn't have an alternative to feed the people. You see, the Boko Haram people are, are a little smarter, unfortunately, because they play, you know, the big brother role. They play, you know, what's this guy? His name, I can't remember again, you know. Um, that, that, that takes the money and distributes to the people. They try to see, oh, this will give us protection. Oh, this will do, do this to that. So they are able to buy the sentiment of the people. But in the South is, IPOP is not providing any of those things that shows the people, we are for you, we are behind you, we are with you. You know, they sold hope that if Biafra is given as a country, we will be the better for it. That was the hope they sold. And the currency of that hope is depreciating on a daily basis. And to and another extent, I want the Eastern leaders, my Oriental brethren, to start to drive that reverse psychology, to drive that reverse um, you know, um, mindset. And I want to appeal to the federal government, please, whatever it takes, know that justice runs a system. You may be winning for today. The South is they have a case, they have a point. It's not, it's not important, it's not, it's, not, it's not okay that, number one, they have the least, you know, one or two states in the north have more local government than the whole of south is put together. 
and our revenue sharing goes into local government and going to local government it's they're going to numbers so i think that the southeast has been marginalized in many ways in the security council how can a whole region not be you know accommodated at the highest level when they are discussing the issues of the southeast in the region who speaks for them who speaks for them what's fair is fair mr president can afford to get a service chief or one of the service chiefs or top people from the southeast he can but each time such opportunity comes there's a strategic realignment and they lose out i think what's <laughs> fair is fair as much as i think that what kanu is doing is absolutely in my opinion you know tactless i think that the ebos have a cause to say it's not okay okay i think i want us to finally take a look at this story um it's on the uh, punch newspaper on the top right um, corner, on the bottom right corner. And it says, Ogun Pensioners Ground Secretariat lock out SSG protesting 68 billion Naira gratuity arrears. So this story really, when I saw it, really struck me because these are old people who carried placards saying pay pensions to all pensioners. They basically grounded, you know, the secretariat's um, house in the governor's office. They blocked the two entrances, you know, to that secretariat for about four hours, carrying placards and asking Governor Abiodun to honor his fathers and, you know, pay their pay their pensions and gratuities. They say they've been owned, owed jointly about 68 billion naira i mean do, do we have to get to this point protest especially by the aged in nigeria who should be receiving their gratuities and enjoying their retirement should we have to get to this level before the government it, does something about it what makes it really really disheartening is that a lot of these people were people who were in the civil service when the civil service was more sane these are people who worked and retired with nothing because there were civil servants. These are people who served the country with their whole heart. A very good example is right inside my house. My mother-in-law, next year she'll be 90. She's extremely, you know, if she didn't have people like, like us, I see her contemporaries when they come to the house and I weep. And she will tell you, oh, this was when I was principal, this was my vice principal. And you look at that person and there could be no better definition of being wretched. Mm. And meanwhile, you go to government house every night. The level of buffet, the drinks every night. These people cannot afford one square meal. The pensioners should be first line charge, if nothing else. Even, I dare say this, before those still in service. And those still in service should be, be the ones advocating for it. There's a story that was showed on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on one of the uh, news, um, TV stations when an, a retiree was making noise. One of them called in and said, please, I'm a retiree like you, please shut up and leave the station. How many times did I come to your office when you were there and I talked to you and I said, one day you come out and meet it. And then you are going back because you've not retired. If you had done what I told you to do, will we be where we are today? I want to appeal to civil servants that are still in service to know that the bed they are lying, they are making now is what they are going to lie on mm. sooner than later. So right. while governors are running riot and doing as they wish, the civil servants themselves should know that that is an inevitable concomitant. They are going to get there. So they should be the ones championing the good of the retirees. That's my take on it. Okay. But for government, they are not thinking. All right. Uh, Mr. Isaac L. Yeah, I talk. thank you very much. Um, as always, for your analysis and for sharing your time with us on uh, the thurs uh, this Thursday morning. Thank you. Wish you a good, Thank you. Uh, good God day bless ahead. you all. Thank you. All right. Stay with us when we come back. A little bit of history. What happened on this day, September 23rd, many, many years ago. We'll be sharing with you here on The Breakfast.